on tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 160. After weeks of delay and partial answers, Hamas delivered its official negotiating position to the different negotiators regarding the hostage deal. In Israel, the first response was rejection, stating that Hamas is still adhering to its unreasonable demands. Initial reports of 21 Palestinians who were killed by IDF fire as they were waiting for an aid convoy in the Kuwait Square of Gaza City. Hamas executes the head of the Dagmash family in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip on accusation of collaborating with the IDF to coordinate the entrance of aid to the northern parts of the Strip. Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas appoints Mohammad Mustafa to be the new Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer voices the most extreme criticism of Netanyahu's government, calling for Israeli elections and placing Netanyahu alongside Hamas and the Palestinian Authority Chairman Abbas as obstacles for peace. Hello everyone, I am Alon Burstein, Visiting Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas War. It is currently the evening of March 14th, 2024 in the United States, the morning of March 15th, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, after delays of several weeks, Hamas gave its official written answer to the negotiators today regarding its position on the Paris framework for hostage exchange. Hamas had previously submitted terms but did not relate to what was agreed upon in the summit, and this, combined with additional conditions that Israel had put on, led to the negotiations completely freezing until now. Hamas's answer was delivered today to Qatar, and from there it was transmitted to Israel. Israel's war cabinet and the Mossad are reportedly studying it. Hamas stated that their response includes details about hostage exchange, outlining Hamas's position on a ceasefire, including stopping the aggression against Gaza, humanitarian aid entrance, restoring internally displaced Gazans to their homes, i.e. to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, and idea of withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. It's important to note that some of these issues, like complete ceasefire and idea of withdrawal, have been rejected by Israel already, and Israel refused to negotiate them. That was one of the things that contributed to the previous breakdown. In the past, negotiators, including the United States and Qatar and Egypt, tried to develop a formula between the sides that would be vague, i.e. stating that there will be an ultimate ceasefire, maybe at some point. This would allow both Israel and Hamas to each state that they did not withdraw from their positions, but allow simultaneously for the hostage exchange to go forward. Hours after this was published, Prime Minister Netanyahu's office stated that Hamas continues to adhere to absurd demands, stating that the subject is going to be debated in the war cabinet tomorrow, however, trying to lower expectations, stating essentially that Hamas has not given anything new. I remind everyone that in the last several days there's been reports in the United States that Hamas is going to give their answer soon, and that there's great fear in the U.S. administration that Netanyahu will reject the, the next round that Hamas proposes. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there was a barrage of rockets from the Gaza Strip targeting the areas of Nativa Salah today. This is the Israeli areas surrounding Gaza Strip. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, Palestinian sources reported that IDF fire was opened at Palestinians awaiting an aid convoy in the Kuwait Square of the areas of Zaytun in Gaza City. Fourteen people were reported killed initially and over 150 injured. The report stated that people were attacked with tank fire and weaponry. The IDF reported there was no deliberate fire in the region, however, the report are being investigated. Moments before I recorded this, the body count went up from 14 to 21. It is likely to even go up more, as again, all this happened in the last several hours. In addition to this, the IDF stated today that a Palestinian unit was trying to fire mortars towards Israel, and that it was attacked from the sky and killed somewhere in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, as almost every day, there was ongoing fighting reported, however, not reported specifically where. Likely this is around the Nusirat or Nitzarim corridor, as well as in the outskirts of of Nusirat refugee camp and El Burej refugee camp. In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip in Hanunis, that's where the bulk of the fighting remains, intensive gun battles were reported today in Hamid City. In one encounter, Hamas operatives were reportedly held up on the fifth floor of a large apartment building as the IDF forces pushed up from the fourth floor. Air units of the IDF eventually struck the fifth floor and the IDF took over the building. Substantial weaponry was reportedly discovered in different apartments throughout Hamid City, including missiles and explosive devices. A rocket launching site was also discovered adjacent to a school and was dismantled. Meanwhile, in Rafah, more information came out about the assassination of Muhammad Abu, Haz- Abu Hassana that I reported upon yesterday. According to reports today, that assassination took place in an area of an UNRWA facility in Rafah. Five more people were reported killed in this attack and 22 injured. Abu Hassana is confirmed assassinated. I remind everyone that as of now, already a, close to a week ago, there was an attempted assassination of Marwan Issa, number three in the Hamas leadership in the Gaza Strip. There's still no confirmation or denial regarding 
confirming if that assassination was actually successful or not. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. Salah Dagmash, who is the Mukhtar, that is a family leader of the Dagmash family in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, was reportedly executed today by a Hamas court for coordination with the IDF. It was recently reported that the IDF was trying to coordinate with local powerful actors in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip to arrange for aid distribution, and Hamas also issued warnings in the last several days against anyone who cooperates with the IDF on this matter. This may end up having vast implications. The Dagmash family is extremely powerful in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. It unto itself has substantial weaponry, a lot of armed operatives. If, in fact, this is going to lead to a collision between the Dagmash family and Hamas, this may end up being influential. The Hamas has lost a lot of its grip in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. That is likely why Israel is trying to coordinate, possibly, with this other family. And if, in fact, war erupts between Hamas and these other factions, it will lead to a lot of different developments in the war. Other news, visiting an IDF base today, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu stated again that there are ongoing international pressures on Israel to stop the country from entering Rafah and, quote, finishing the job, but that he, as Prime Minister, is withstanding all these pressures. Other news, Planet Loves, which is a private satellite company, published images today of high-resolution shots taken of Hanunis between January 19th and March 2nd. The images show extensive destruction throughout the city, including in the heart of the city, western, eastern, and southern parts. A lot of these images were uploaded and created a lot of media responses. Regarding casualties, while no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, the official number of IDF soldiers that kill, were killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began has been updated by the IDF to 250. This is one more than was updated previously. It could mean that a soldier died of his injuries and was sustained earlier. This is somewhat strengthened by the, by the fact that, again, the number of soldiers that were injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion w- began has gone down on the official IDF report to 1,474. Either way, the current number stands as 250 soldiers that died since the invasion began in the Gaza Strip, and 1,474 IDF soldiers have been injured since the invasion began in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Health Ministry is reporting that 69 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. That brings the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 31,341. 73,134 Palestinians reported injured in the Gaza Strip. I will add, however, that these numbers were reported prior to the incident in Kuwait Square of Gaza City, so the numbers are likely to increase as the hours go on. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. The ship that departed Cyprus two days ago is due to arrive on the shores of Gaza tomorrow. I reported several days ago on the contents of the ship and how it is going to actually deliver the aid. The IDF emphasized today that the cargo has been inspected and that this maritime corridor that is being developed does not mean that the naval siege on Gaza has been canceled. All ships still have to coordinate all of their entrances with the IDF. This current ship is carrying 180 tons of aid, reportedly is primarily food. The aid is going to be delivered to an area near the Nitzarim or Nusirat corridor that is in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, and this delivery is going to be under the protection of the IDF. The operation is reportedly being viewed as a pilot, and based upon its result, adjustments to the plan that the United States is is developing regarding creating this maritime corridor are going to be made. The IDF is also working with the World Central Kitchen directly, seemingly as part of its attempt to bypass UNRWA in delivering and dispersing the aid as well. In addition to this, the IDF reported that 244 trucks carrying food, water, medical supplies, and shelters entered the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. Other news, and moving on to a segment that does not appear in my reports every night, in Israel. A Palestinian attack was carried out in the Beit Kama Junction. Fadi al-Taif, who is a Palestinian Israeli who was born and raised in the Gaza Strip, however he obtained Israeli citizenship four years ago as one of his parents is Israeli, stabbed and killed a 51-year-old Israeli. The victim, Uri Moyal, was armed and was able to shoot and kill al-Taif prior to succumbing to his wounds. The results of this attack are one Israeli who was stabbed and killed. Moving on to the West Bank, the substantial IDF activity that was reported in various different areas of the West Bank in the last 24 hours. IDF activity was noted in the areas of Jericho, Dora Village near Hebron, Kalkilia, and Lubana Sharkia near Nablus. Confrontations reportedly erupted in Nablus, there were substantial gun battles reported. In the different operations, weaponry was confiscated and explosive devices were also uncovered. 13 Palestinians reported they were arrested in the last 24 hours in the West Bank. There were no reports made about how many Palestinians were injured. Other news, leading up to the first Friday of Ramadan coming up this weekend, the Israeli police announced today that fake news is being disseminated, including falsified information that the Israeli police have established fences to block people from entering the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The police published the pictures that were being disseminated, stating that this is an old photo of maintenance being done in the area, asking everyone to not succumb to fake news. 
Amidst this, Hamas again put out a call to Palestinians to come spend days and nights to defend Al-Aqsa Mosque this weekend, stating that the people in Gaza are carrying out their part in defense of Al-Aqsa and calling upon Palestinians in the West Bank to do the same. Political news from the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas officially appointed Muhammad Mustafa to be the next Palestinian Prime Minister. Mustafa is a longtime ally of Mahmoud Abbas and a Fatah member, and he previously served as Deputy Prime Minister and Economy Minister in the Palestinian governments. He's also the head of the Palestinian Investment Fund, which has put him in contact with a lot of different business officials, both regionally and internationally. His appointment comes two weeks after Palestinian faction summit meeting had decided to create a unity technocratic government. He is meant to lead this government both for the West Bank and after the war in the Gaza Strip. His charter is to organize and rebuild Gaza and work to unify Palestinian institutions in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip under one leadership. Importantly, Hamas did not make any public statements about this approval. When the meeting between the Palestinian factions was first first initiated, it was reported that they would create a unity government that would be made up of technocrats, however, that there would be a prime minister, and Hamas did not put forth who they would like the prime minister to be. In turn, the Fatah movement, led by Mahmoud Abbas, quite immediately said that they wanted it to be Muhammad Mustafa, and it remains to be seen if Hamas actually accepts this, or if Hamas will in turn establish its own government, its own prime minister, leading to more rivalry. Other political news, the United States imposed new sanctions on three Israeli settlers today, Tzvi Bar Yosef, Neria Ben Pazi, and Moshe Sharvit, for taking part in violent activity against Palestinians. Two unauthorized settlements in the West Bank were also put under sanctions. This is the first time that unauthorized settlements are specifically put under sanctions rather than individuals. Responding to this, Israel's finance minister and head of religious Zionism, Betzalel Smotrich, stated that this is another capitulation of the Biden administration to a BDS campaign that is aimed at smearing the entirety of Israel. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, after the escalations from the last several days, yesterday there was already somewhat of a dying down, today also there were a lot less rockets and missiles fired, and also correspondingly a lot less IDF activity. Regarding rockets and missiles, one barrage was reportedly fired towards Kibbutz Malachia in the northern parts of Israel, and there was also an air target, presumably a drone, intercepted above the areas of Kfar Blum. Both of these Hezbollah took responsibility for. Regarding IDF activity, IDF warplanes attacked Hezbollah military structures in the areas of Anakora, as to enter infrastructures in the areas of Yarun. Other attacks were also reported in the Kunin area, and artillery fire was also reported in, the, in Wadi Hamul. El Miadin reported the IDF artillery fire also in the areas of Tir Herfa, and Al Akbar reported the other IDF attacks in Marun Aras. However, again, there were no reports of deaths or injuries from these different attacks, and compared to the escalations that we've seen in the last several weeks, and particularly two days ago, this is relatively calm. Moving on to some of the regional developments, in Yemen, El Masira, which is a Houthi-affiliated Yemeni news channel, reported two coalition attacks were carried out in the Hudaydah port. Earlier in the day, the U.S. Central Command stated that the Houthis launched a ballistic missile towards a ship south of Aden and that the, and the, the, the missile missed the ship. In retaliation, the United States attacked and destroyed four drones and a service-to-air Houthi missile. Other news, the Russian news agency RIA reported that the Houthis have stated that, they, that their weapons arsenal now includes hypersonic missiles. Hypersonic missiles are missiles that travel faster than the speed of sound. They have been used by Russia and Ukraine. They're also made by Iran. According to some reports, they have obtained missiles that can travel at Mach 8. The Houthis have been stating in the last several weeks that they are preparing new surprises in their weapons, and while this report is anonymous and cites Russian sources only, if this is true, this could mean a major escalation in the capabilities of the Houthis to both carry out attacks against ships, as well as in their capabilities of actually targeting Israel and causing damage as opposed to most of their missiles, which are currently intercepted. Moving on to some of the political and general trends of the last 24 hours, the largest escalation of diplomatic blows between the U.S. administration and the Netanyahu-led government, Chuck Schumer, the majority Senate leader, directly challenged Prime Minister Netanyahu's premiership today. He stated that out of reverence for his position as a Jew who cares deeply about Israel, he must speak. Vis-a-vis -vis Netanyahu, he stated, and I quote, I believe that in his heart, he has the highest priority, has, has the highest priority is security of Israel. However, I also believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take precedence over the best interests of Israel. He has put himself in a coalition with far-right extremists like Ministers Smotrich and Ben Gvir, and as a result, he has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to a historic low. 
He stated that Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah state and chastised Netanyahu for the attempted judicial coup over the last year as well. In addition, he added that Netanyahu's coalition no longer fits Israel's realities after October 7th and concluded with a further escalation, stating, and again I quote, Hamas and the Palestinians who support and tolerate their evil ways, radical right-wing Israelis in government and society, President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu. These are the four obstacles to peace. Five months into the conflict, it is clear that Israelis have to take stock of the situation and ask, must we change course? And at this critical juncture, I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy, open, decision-making process about the future of Israel. So again, this is the largest escalation that we've seen in the diplomatic rhetoric of the United States chastising the Netanyahu government. Hours later, Schumer tweeted that the U.S. clearly does not dictate a new election for Israel and that the Israeli public will choose its leaders. However, he again called to give the Israeli public a choice, i.e. again calling for elections. As expected, Netanyahu's Likud party put out an enraged response. They stated, and I quote, Israel is not a banana republic, but a proud independent democracy that elected Prime Minister Netanyahu. The party then added that Schumer is wrong and Netanyahu's policies are supported by the vast majority of Israelis, specifically referencing complete victory over Hamas, international dictations of a Palestinian terror state, and objecting to restoring the Palestinian Authority in Gaza, i.e. most of the things that the United States is seeing as a vision for the future, the creation of a Palestinian state, and also bringing in the Palestinian Authority in a revitalized way in order to take control of the Gaza Strip, the what the Likud is sending back is specifically that Israel is going to refuse those things of the United States. Meanwhile, in Israel, Minister Gantz, who is leading the polls by far over Netanyahu, stated that Schumer is a true friend of Israel, but that he misspoke since Israel is a strong democracy and only its citizens will determine its future leadership. Meanwhile, the White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby stated that the White House was in fact informed in advance about Schumer's intent and what he was going to say, and that Schumer did not ask permission for his words, and the White House did not try to stop him. So, what we are seeing here is a vast escalation in the rhetoric between the U.S. administration and the criticism of the U.S. administration and the Netanyahu-led government, and in turn we're seeing that in the response, the Netanyahu government is becoming more and more explicit in saying it is not going to adhere to the vision of the United States regarding the future, it remains to be seen how this will impact the way the war develops and what will happen if a hostage deal does not co- not continue, if Israel will go against the U.S. demands and carry out an invasion of Rafah, or how this is going to develop. If you enjoy these reports, please do remember to give them a like, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. If you'd like me to put out special videos that address certain facets of the war, feel free to leave them in the comment section as well. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.